All right. Uh, good evening to everyone uh, all across the U.S. and also to some overseas people who are logged in. Uh, our uh, agenda today for the February 2013 uh, seminar uh, that is coming to you from the IBM Innovation Center in Foster City, California. I'm your moderator, Erfan Ibrahim, calling in remotely from Northern Virginia today. Uh, we are very pleased to have Jerry Ramey uh, present on reliability threats to smart grid communications. He'll speak for about 40 to 45 minutes, and then we're going to have a general Q&A. Uh, our session will end at uh, 7.30 Pacific uh, today. Uh, this uh, particular topic is uh, of reliability threats to smart grid communications is becoming more and more important as uh, the smart grid communications is moving more and more onto the wireless uh, medium. Uh, there are uh, several uh, sources of interference. Uh, some are man-made and some are natural. And uh, these uh, types of uh, threats to communications is becoming more pronounced the more byte intensive applications are becoming, the higher the bandwidth requirements are there for smart grid communications. So even a short period of outage can lead to considerable uh, setbacks for the utility as well as for customers in terms of availability of electricity. Uh, and Jerry is going to get into deeper into what are some of the implications of uh, extended outages as well as high impact. We lost your voice. You're not, you're not hearing me. Yeah. yeah but okay. Why does it suck? Mm -hmm. Use the phone. Oh. <clears throat> He's on VoIP. You're not able to hear me. <clears throat> Perfon, we can't hear you. You can't hear me. Hello. Yes. Uh, for those of you online, uh, is is anybody able to hear my audio? Okay, so it seems to be a problem. It seems to be a problem at IBM and not at other locations. So uh, I'm 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 getting a response from other people online that uh, it's not a problem and they can hear my audio. Yeah. So um, Jerry, what I would say. Yeah, I. Thank you for making. <laughs> yeah. Now I can see that I was right to be worried about this. Yes. Um, so uh, for those of you online, just uh, hold on a second oh, while I send a message. While I send a message for them to, oh, because I can hear their audio, but they can't hear me. So hold on. Now we can't hear you. Modern technology. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. This is like a developer. But it's, it's saying we're talking because on the thing it says. Hello? Maybe. Uh, yes. Can you hear us now? Yes. So the, for those of you online, it is fine. Uh, we can hear. Uh, you can hear me just fine. It is the folks uh, over in IBM who have called in. That we're having some problems with their Here, phone. Neither you'd be in real good shape. <laughs> <laughs> then okay, we are you? Okay, so they're going to uh, dial in again. So I apologize uh, for some of the sound issues from uh, Foster City, but as soon as they come back on, uh, then we can get started. Uh, but just to continue on um, the comments here, uh, my introductory comments. Um, so the challenge uh, right now in uh, Smart Grid is that we have a variety of uh, communication technologies that are being married together, um, and they have different uh, uh, bandwidths. Um, they have different uh, frequencies in which they operate. And so they are faced with different types of interferences. As I mentioned, some of them are man-made. For instance, uh, we have uh, in the industrial, scientific, and medical band, the ISM band, uh, several sources of interference, both in the 900 megahertz as well as in the 2.4 gigahertz. And then we have 
um, interferences that occur from uh, weather, from storms, from especially electrical storms that occur, um, as well as uh, things that happen, you know, on um, in the sun and the solar flares and so on. So there are many, many sources of interferences, and what these do is for short periods of time or even long periods of time, they can considerably reduce the bandwidth, uh, the ability to carry uh, data uh, on these wireless networks. So if a lot of the smart grid communications uh, is going to control and manage the grid in this just-in-time network, it's really important to understand what those threat vectors are and uh, and then uh, do something about it to mitigate the risk. So um, at this point, what I'm going to do is try to bring them in again. Uh, let's see if this is them. Okay, are you uh, are you on now? Yes. Yes, we can hear you. Okay, very good. So um, I am going to now uh, pass the presenter ball to you, Jerry. Um, Thank and, you. Um, providing you some background on what causes some of these threats to smart grid communications. And then you can then share your desktop and um, get the presentation going. So I should, the presenter ball is now yours, Jerry. Shove that bad boy over here. So then you just go under share and say share desktop. And that should move you into that mode at the top. When it says file, edit, share, go to share and say application. Share desktop. It means application. We're on our way. Okay. Nope. nope. Just share desktop. There we go. There. Didn't see it. Yep. So now. What happened? He lost the connection. We don't see anything. Be patient. It's an old machine. <laughs> <clears throat> yes, uh, just fine. bear with us. Yes, there we go. Bear with us. This is normal. Okay, you should see my uh, PowerPoint control screen, right, uh, Irfan? Yes, we are seeing it. And you can go into full mode, yes. There we go. Wow. <clears throat> ARC All right. Technical so before we, yeah, Jerry, before we get started. Smart grid communications. By you. Lopped off my name. I'm Jerry Ramey with ARC Technical Resources, San Jose, California. You look familiar. Yep. <laughs> The outline begins with a short smart grid communications overview. Then the electromagnetic threats, including interference issues in substations and distribution, intentional EMI, geomagnetic storms, and electromagnetic pulps. And it ends with some recent examples of cybersecurity threat. But I'm not going to tell you how to fix them. The AMI integrated communications infrastructure supports interaction between the utility, the consumer portal, and any controllable electrical loads on the home area network. It must employ open, that's non-proprietary, bidirectional encrypted communication and is the foundation of all modern grid functions. It is required by the other key technologies and essential to the modern power grid. Due to its dependency on data acquisition, protection, and control, the modern grid cannot exist without an effective integrated communications infrastructure. Establishing these communications must be of the highest priority since it is the first step in building the modern grid. This entry figure gives one view of the complexity of the integrated communications system required to support the modern grid. The information infrastructure is, is shown in red. So we're not going anywhere with Smart Grid without an integrated communication system. Oh, it's slower than I remember. Sorry. 
down. Typical architecture. Supporting media must accurately and securely transmit information at the required speed with the required throughput. Future application bandwidth requirements should be considered when choosing media for an application. Various architectures can be used, the most common being local concentrators that collect data from groups of meters and transmit that data to a central network operations center via a backhaul. Tending to cut off my files, which I don't understand. But we'll do our best to get through it. A typical smart grid communications hierarchy is shown. Broadband is not required at the home metering point for AMI functionality, so speed requirements within the home are slow, with higher bandwidth requirements mandated as one moves back towards the network operations center or NOC. The scale of the coverage covers from square feet to continents. Internet protocol, or IP, is the norm for backhaul from the neighborhood area data aggregators to the wide area network and back to the NOC. Note that some manufacturers supply more bandwidth than is necessary, and usually to sell to the consumer inside the building, if my sound files would finish. Every large power company has a network operations center where people keep the generation and consumption of power in balance. They use diverse communications networks and media to dispatch resources, supervise substations, and react to faults. As more renewables come online to replace more constant forms of generation, sensors that track actual power flows over shorter periods of time will become more important. Short-term forecasting of wind velocity and cloud cover will become more necessary as variability in renewables could cause instability if alternate power sources cannot be dispatched quickly. With large investments in communications to support smart meters underway, it is believed that power companies will depend on these networks to enable them to operate the grid with less margin between generation capacity and loads. Distribution automation and restoration, demand response, and customer billing could be affected if communications to smart meters or distribution equipment is comp compromised. The EMC threat. Southern Illinois, September 25th, 2001. A solid-state relay controller interrupts a transmission line for no apparent reason. The 470 megahertz handheld radio was found to be the cause. The man on the operating room table died as a result of this. Commonwealth Ed Con Ed was sued, lost, and work began at EPRI on EMC and substations as a result of this event. Haddam Neck, Connecticut, 1997. A deafening release of pressurized halon fire suppressant gas occurred in Connecticut at the Haddam Neck plant, causing the ceiling tiles to fall into the control room and all of its occupants to be evacuated. It was caused by camera flashes from the photographer taking pictures in the control room. Inadequate immunity to common sources of interference causes unacceptable failures such as this. Darn photographers. Shouldn't let him in the control room. Security breach. Indian Point, New York, March 23rd, 2008. An emergency shutdown of a reactor at the Indian Point nuclear power plant was caused by signals from a worker's digital camera. The Journal News reported on June 11th, 2008. Federal regulators said radio frequencies from a Kodak C340 digital zoom camera operated too close to a control panel interfered with a boiler pump controller that provides water to four steam generators. Quote, the direct cause was radio frequency interference from the camera, unquote, NRC spokesman Neil Sheehan said. All that had to happen was for the camera to be on. Also, back in 1997, there was a similar incident where halon fire suppressant gas was released in Connecticut. Which I showed you. That's caused by an insufficient compatibility margin, and this is caused by me reusing an old slide. The trends in hardware are the miniaturization of devices resulting in smaller gaps in the geometries, lower power consumption, meaning smaller voltage swings, 
quieter signals inside the chips, higher clock speeds, well above 3 gigahertz, wider bandwidth ports, including Wi-Fi microwave, meaning increasingly vulnerable digital products. If you were told things were going to be getting better, you were lied to. The trends in compatibility are an increasing number of radiators, an increasing number of receptors, increasing susceptibility of those receptors, increasing dependence on the Internet, and hence an increasing vulnerability of the infrastructure. Immunity tests simulate common electromagnetic phenomena that could cause upset. One familiar phenomenon is electrostatic discharge, or ESD, from human furniture contact with vulnerable equipment. Another is electrical fast transients from switching operations with contact bounce and arcing. These fast rise time, low energy events are common in utility settings and readily latch up digital electronics not designed to resist their intrusion. Lightning strikes or switching events cause electrical surges measuring into the thousands of amps. Communications and control systems for the smart grid infrastructure must be designed to be immune to these strikes. Radiated RF energy is all around us and increasing. When those RF fields cut across long conductors, they become conducted RF energy. Methods and criteria exist to quantify equipment immunity to these phenomena and assure reliable operation in the presence of RF energy. Utility environments often entail exposure to large power frequency magnetic fields as well, and all environments experience common power dips and interruptions. <clears throat> EMC and vulnerability are interrelated. Equipment reliability will surely be impaired by EMC problems, and EMC validation through testing assures reliable operation in the field. You think? Is IEC 61850-3 relevant to our work? Absolutely. Recent advertisements in Power Grid International magazine would indicate it's a sales feature. The link from the SEL ad touts that their communications products are, quote, hardened to meet stringent IEEE and IEC tests for harsh environments, unquote. The Cisco ad on the right notes that our ruggedized routers and switches already comply with IEC 61850-3 and IEEE 1613 standards. It also notes that, quote, next generation networks, unquote, will be based on IEC 61850-3 standards as investment protection. IEC 61850-3 requires these immunity tests shown on the right. IEC 61000-4-6, conducted RF immunity. IEC 61000-4-3, radiated RF fields covered by C37.90.2. IEC 61000-4-8, power frequency magnetic fields. IEC 61000-4-10, damped oscillatory magnetic fields. IEC 61000-4-16, conducted common mode disturbances. IEC 61000-4-4, EFT covered by C37.90.1. IEC 61000-4-5, surge. IEC 61000-4-12, ringed and damped oscillatory waves, which is covered under C37.90.1. <laughs> the five gaps found when comparing this European list to tests covered in the U.S. under IEEE C37.90.X series are shown in red in this table. And these were the five gaps that were reported out of the uh, NIST SGIP EMI Issues Working Group to be implemented under IEEE 1613.1 extension to 1613. I'm trying to close the gaps that NIST told us to close. The NIST SGIP EMI Issues Working Group referred the five gap immunity tests to the IEEE P1613.1 Working Group for inclusion in their upcoming draft of the extension to IEEE 1613. It's the standard for communications devices in substations. The five gaps are in the final report, also sent to the NIST SGIP governing board, which can ignore the recommendations and do nothing, or authorize a PAP or priority action plan to begin addressing the gaps, or authorize the Smart Grid Testing and Certification Committee action to address those gaps, which is most likely.
gaps in American utility EMC standards. These five gap immunity tests were referenced in the P1613.1 draft. IEC 61850-3 invoked the test levels for substation products that were used in the draft and called out for products used in Zone A that's inside the substation fence, as shown in the middle column. Zone B is defined in the draft as outside the substation fence in the distribution network and requires a lower test level in each case. The final draft of P1613.1 also uses the existing acceptance criteria from IEEE 1613 2009, which is being adopted in Europe as well. These criteria apply for Class 1 devices where recovered disruptions are allowed and Class 2 devices where no disruptions are allowed, which implies an optical connection. This criteria requires that communications functions be exercised during the application of the test waveforms. We're very pleased that uh, the IEC has also basically adopted 1613's acceptance criteria. Now manufacturers on both sides of the pond can test their products the same and evaluate them the same during the test. The idea is so you don't have to test it twice. RF hazards. Clause 7.3 of the draft states that wiring shall be consistent with the manufacturer's recommended procedures and the EUT shall be tested in its case with the covers and access doors in the closed position. Owners of installed communications networking devices may not be aware of the hazards that exist when these covers or doors are left open. There is anecdotal evidence of misoperations caused by cell phones or tablets transmitting within three meters of an open door on a communication networking device. Thus, manufacturers are encouraged to place warning labels on all the access doors and covers, alerting the user that a misoperation may occur if the doors are left open and that phones and tablets should not be allowed closer than three meters from the equipment. This is the same as what happened in Indian Point, New York as well when the, the camera of the C340 Kodak camera was turned on to take the picture, the, open, the doors were all open in the back of the racks, and simply having the camera on interfered with the pump controller in that case. <clears throat> Smart meter EMC yeah. testing. Outside the substation fence and distribution, or zone B, smart meter EMC testing has found to be inadequate. ANSI C12.1 contains nine EMC tests. Only the two magnetic field tests are free of problems. They each have established test levels and methods, a clear acceptance criteria to be assessed during the test, and require that the meter be operating normally during the test. The destructive surge test needs more clarification about the number of strikes, their polarity, and some missing phase angles. The other five have serious issues. Two of these are radio emissions tests governed by the FCC using C63.4 methods, which C12.1 does not follow. The other three are non-destructive immunity tests where the EUT power metering, I.O., and communications functions are all disabled in violation of the standards cited and in violation of the methods used earlier in those magnetic field tests. This C12.1 standard is up for renewal this year. I expect that the EMC Society of the IEEE will want some control over the new version. Yes, and the C63.org, uh, the uh, ANSI Accredited Standards Committee, is going to want to see their standard used correctly or they're going to ballot negatively. And Subcommittee 5 in C63 is going to want to see the immunity test done correctly for smart meters or they're going to ballot negatively as an entity. So this. C12.1 has problems. There are three high power electromagnetic threats considered by the IEEE EMC Society for which equipment may be protected. High altitude electromagnetic pulse or hemp created by a nuclear detonation in space. Geomagnetic storms created by solar activity that have created regional power blackouts in the past due to the creation of severe harmonics in large transformers and intentional EMI, formally defined as intentional malicious generation of electromagnetic energy introducing noise or signals into electric and electronic systems, thus disrupting, confusing, or damaging these systems for terrorist or criminal purposes. So we're done talking about the EMC or 
standards-based threats of this device doesn't give it along with that other device in a substation or up on a pole. Now we're talking about high, high power, high amplitude events, geomagnetic storms, nuclear bombs, and terrorists and criminals. It's the fun part. Intentional EMI can be seen in recent events, like in Reno, Nevada in 1996, when slot machines were hardened against sabotage by their manufacturer after successful attacks with portable EM disruptors, or in the Aichi Prefecture of Japan in 1998, when two Yakuza criminals used a concealed high-energy radio frequency device to fool a pachinko machine into spitting out cash. In Reno, Nevada, the guy had a six-volt motorcycle battery in each boot. I don't know where the contactor went. And out, <laughs> thank you. And out comes 30,000 volts, which would normally go to the spark plug, which instead went to the coin slot. This is very effective. Out came the quarters. Or in St. Petersburg, Russia in 1998, when a jewelry store alarm was defeated by a criminal using an electromagnetic weapon. Or in London, when a bank was blackmailed with the threat of an electromagnetic attack to neutralize their information technology infrastructure. In the Netherlands, an individual disrupted a bank's IT network because he was refused a loan. He constructed a briefcase-sized electromagnetic weapon, which he learned how to build from the Internet. Go on. Tell me you can't do it. Here's Rotoslav Persion, who built this electromagnetic weapon from scavenged parts. But these surplus military components were not considered sensitive. He reports they have disrupted and destroyed cars, radios, intravenous pumps, and computers. He's immortal. <laughs> He's holding the guts of a uh, microwave oven in his hand. You can see the power cord coming down there. He has more likelihood of frying himself than other things. This one's not In Moscow, a telephone central office was knocked out of operation as a result of malicious remote voltage injection into a telephone line. 200,000 people lost telephone service that day. That Seoul, Korea, in early March of 2011, a jamming attack disabled a large number of industrial GPS-enabled systems. Mm. South Korean military reported that some of their systems had also been adversely affected. I wonder who could be doing that. In early 2012, it was reported that GPS systems near the Incheon International Airport in South Korea were being jammed and that incoming oh, flights good. had been warned about this situation. Most computers and the systems they support are vulnerable to intentional EMI. Quote, Virtually any electronic system could be disabled or even destroyed by electromagnetic interference, unquote. According to Dr. Todd Hubing, former president of the IEEE EMC Society. Never met a box you can't break. A small disruptor can be used to protect a vehicle or convoy from attack by jamming or actuating cell phone detonators. The basic system is omnidirectional but can be configured with a directional pattern. Ultra wideband technology is under development, which will cover the frequency ranges from megahertz to gigahertz, effectively denying all types of communications with a directional or omnidirectional coverage area. New offerings include several types of high power electromagnetic modules, including elements now concealed in the doors of police cars, enabling police to stop a suspect vehicle by driving up next to it. Yeah, right. <laughs> I love that story. <laughs> Yes, for only $5,000, you too can buy an electromagnetic weapon in the European Union today. A high-power electromagnetic weaponized vehicle can be useful against IEDs embedded in roads. They are effective against various electronic devices, such as electronic fuse, cell phone, or any other actuating device. The U.S. military has recently reintroduced an electromagnetic beam to its arsenal of non-lethal weapons designed to break up riots, like those recently directed at U.S. troops in Afghanistan. It's been cleared for use on the battlefront for several years, but to this day remains unused. The Marines have staged riot scenes demonstrating that protesters are harmlessly dispersed with the active denial system. 
Using an electromagnetic beam that travels hundreds of meters, it heats people's skin just enough to trigger their instincts to flee. I want one. <laughs> Unlike explosive flux compression weapons used in the opening moments of the Iraq War, the new CHAMP missile can deliver multiple strikes and keep on flying. During a recent flight test in the Utah desert, the missile successfully defeated electronic targets with little or no collateral damage. Computers. CHAMP only destroys computers and electronics, not buildings or people. It's a non-kinetic alternative to flux compression or traditional explosive weapons. A little expensive for my you know, budget. This figure illustrates how electromagnetic waves couple onto communications, data, and power lines, which all lead to electronic equipment that may not be able to resist malfunctions caused by them. Several options for mitigation of these effects include better electromagnetic shielding, increase the quality of the shielding effectiveness of the building in the frequency range of importance, windows, doors, wooden walls are leaky to high frequency fields, should be covered with grounded metal foil or metalized cloth. Filter and surge suppress all conductive lines entering the facility. Secure them outside the facility. Increase the standoff distances using physical security, such as fencing, to keep assailants far away from power and communication lines, or to take advantage of the 1 over R falloff in E fields from their antennas. And use electromagnetic alarms to monitor the environment. Watch for the beginning and duration of any intentional EMI attack in order to catch the perpetrator. This is a good time to mention that intentional EMI attacks come in two major flavors. Radiated, which I've been showing you here. That's the guy uses an antenna, tries to get as close as he can and does bad things. And my favorite, conducted, which is more effective, but you have to be closer and actually touching the guy's power lines or his data or I.O. lines. The bad news about conducted is you're touching, which means you're nearby. So if he's able to see an attack in progress, he can go outside and look at what trick is connected to his, you know, phone line or his data. The idea is to catch the guy in the act. To mitigate the effects of intentional EMI, reduce the coupling to cables and restrict the effects of coupled signals on them by laying out cables along metallic surfaces, preferably with copper tape. Use shielded cables and connectors. Use ferrites on metallic cables to suppress common mode currents. Use surge protection devices at the equipment interface to shunt conducted energy. And use non-metallic optical cabling to replace metallic cables. Particularly Ethernet, which is particularly vulnerable to outside EMI, intentionally EMI. While these may seem to be exotic threats to some, international standards organizations are dealing with these threats for civil equipment and systems. In addition, there's questions being asked by the Congress Department of Homeland Security hearing about whether these high-level electromagnetic threats are being considered in the smart grid. The IEEE's EMC Society, TC5, is working on a recommended practice for protecting publicly accessible computers from intentional EMI. Seagray has just begun work in C4.206 on protecting substation control electronics from intentional EMI. And the ITU has been working since 2005 to protect telephone and data network centers. And they've finished two recommendations regarding hemp and intentional EMI. The IEC, SC77, has been working for 20 years developing a body of standards and reports, over 20, to protect civil electronic equipment and systems from hemp and intentional EMI. Note that these are basic standards that do not recommend immunity levels for equipment, but are applied on a case-by-case -case basis. Artist conception of the Boeing CHAMP missile. Another high-power electromagnetic disturbance occurs naturally. NOAA defines severe geomagnetic storms as those that occur once or more during the solar cycle, which is usually about 11 years historically. Notice how the brightness and spot density of the sun changes over the 10 years that are shown. An extreme geomagnetic storm is defined as only occurring about once every 100 years. The effects are widely dispersed over a continent and very slowly in time, wreaking havoc on any geographically diffuse system, and particularly on power systems, with the reliance on grounded transformers. The last big one was in 1989. Peak of the solar cycle. 
Coronal mass ejections or a fluctuating electro chip from the sun cause a large increase in charged particles being ejected from the sun and into the solar wind towards the Earth. This change of charge state can interact with the Earth's magnetic field to produce significant distortions of the geomagnetic field at the surface. This somewhat rapid variation of the geomagnetic field, which happens over a few seconds to a few minutes, induces time-varying or quasi-DC electric fields onto the surface of the Earth itself, often near the poles. About 0 0.4 hertz. The large yellow arrow illustrates the magnetic field being impinged onto the Earth from a fluctuating electrojet or mass ejection. Millions of amperes of current can flow through highly conductive seawater, and the fields induce large voltage potential differences onto the surface of the Earth. The resulting quasi-DC voltage gradients force large ground-induced currents into the power system through its ground connections. Then the fried transformer is a result. These effects can lead to voltage collapse of the power grid, as experienced in Quebec on March 13th of 1989. This graphic shows the field disturbance conditions minutes after the collapse of the Quebec power network. The colors represent magnetic field rate of change in nanoteslas per minute over North America at 1745 UTC on that date. The area of severe field change covers most of Canada, and this footprint can and has moved further south during other historically extreme geomagnetic storms. The resulting quasi-DC, or 0.4 hertz, voltage gradients force large currents into the grounded neutrals of power transformers, saturating their cores, increasing the inductance of their loads, and causing severe harmonic distortion before they blow up from overheating. These photos show one of the highly exposed transformers after the 1989 event. Notice the internal conductors are mostly melted. Since the spectral densities of these storms are so similar to the late timer E3 portion of a nuclear pulse, the mitigations are similar as well, although the specifications of the protective devices may differ. The electromagnetic pulse is the generic term for all types of nuclear-generated electromagnetic transients. Of greater interest is the EMP created by high-altitude nuclear detonations, usually defined by a burst height greater than 30 kilometers. At this great height, the radiation produced by the burst does not reach the Earth's surface, but several types of electromagnetic fields do. The concern is that these high-power electromagnetic fields with their large coverage area will create problems for the computers and related electronic systems on the surface that control critical infrastructures, such as power, telecommunications, transportation, guidance, finance, water, food, etc. Concern was great enough that the U.S. Congress has held hearings on the topic and appointed an EMP commission to recommend solutions. North Korea has just miniaturized and tested their first weapon last week. This graph shows intentional EMI spectra above 300 megahertz as wideband and the higher intensity narrowband emissions. High altitude electromagnetic pulse, or HEMP, is composed of three time frequency segments. Early time E1 HEMP travels at the speed of light from the explosion and reaches field strengths of 50 kV per meter within 10 nanoseconds. Its spectral density versus frequency is shown by the blue line. Intermediate time HEMP reaches 100 volts per meter from one microsecond to one second later, and late time hemp reaches 40 volts per kilometer at one to several hundred seconds after the vent, which is similar to geomagnetic storms. Based on prior studies, E1 and E3 hemp are the biggest concerns to the electric power grid since the high peak field strengths are efficiently coupled into the power lines from E1 and into the control lines from E3. Both types of transients have large coverage areas. Early time E1 hemp is characterized by a fast rise time narrow width E field pulse about 2.5 by 25 nanoseconds that propagates at the speed of light from the burst point. The surface area covered depends on the burst height, 
Due to the rapid rise time of the E1 pulse, the resulting frequency content is much louder and much broader in range than lightning or substation switching events out in the yard. These intense fields can couple onto low voltage control and communications cabling within the control building and deliver 20 kV or more to the electronics inside. This is typically destructive for control and protective relaying equipment in the racks. In addition to damaging levels of conducted voltage into the blockhouse, the radiated E field would penetrate the walls of most substation control houses not designed to attenuate them. As you can see from the table, typical construction methods only achieve a few dB of shielding effectiveness. Critical facilities may need to be retrofitted with architectural shielding or even a shielded enclosure with appropriate penetrations. At a minimum, critical restoration equipment can be stored in shielded cabinets or rooms for use after an event. The tall vertical antenna towers extending down to the ground and nearby buildings offer a near-perfect pickup geometry for E1 hemp fields. Unless good RF grounding practices are strictly adhered to, such as circumferential bonding of all the shielded cables coming into the control building, high-level E1 currents and voltages will propagate efficiently into the coupling and connected electronics, likely destroying them. E1 hemp will also couple efficiently onto above-ground distribution lines and low voltage drops into homes and businesses. 70% of U.S. distribution wiring is above ground, which can experience up to 1 megavolt of common mode voltage with a 10 nanosecond rise time and 100 nanosecond duration. All insulators will flash over simultaneously, causing mechanical damage to some of them and allowing up to several hundred kV of voltage onto the low voltage drops probably frying the smart meters. Distribution line sensors and controls would be fully exposed to the E1 hemp, so assets without protection on the sensors, cabling, control electronics, and communications lines will probably be lost. Improved high-frequency grounding, filtering, and surge suppression of those products could help. There's so much of this out, not likely it's going to get done. The protection of control centers is becoming increasingly important. While there is great variability in the shielding effectiveness of various building types, the best approach to avoid E1 hemp coupling is to place the control center in the middle of a large building on a low floor or in the basement, away from the windows. Soil and rebar in concrete provide some protection from high frequency E fields. Avoid locating a control room on a high floor or near walls or windows as the penetration of the field will be greater. Ethernet cabling is particularly vulnerable to pulsed electromagnetic fields, so consider replacing it with non-conductive fiber. As smart grid communications and controls are added in the future, the logical choice is to rebuild the control center in a shielded enclosure with controlled penetrations, as the military has been doing for years. For power generators, the E1 hemp threat is the low voltage controls of power plants, including SCADA, communications, controls, antennas, cabling, and electronics infrastructure, should be protected to at least remain undamaged. Resetting and restoration is easier for generators since people are present at the plant to conduct these operations. For distributed generation, the variability of renewables drives the need for functional communications leaks to keep generation and loads in balance. Both wind and solar installations will be exposed to E1 hemp fields, but additional test data are needed to determine if the wind turbines and inverters themselves can survive the effects of a burst. My initial reaction from doing some work on the wind turbines in Illinois is that they won't. Poor immunity. For E1 high-frequency hemp, improved high-frequency grounding, filtering, and surge suppression are the mitigations. For E3 low-frequency hemp and extreme geomagnetic storms, the mitigation approach is to prevent or lessen the induced currents in the earth from coupling onto the grounded neutrals of the high-voltage transformers and substations. Neutral capacitors can block this current, and large resistors can reduce it, but fa fast bypass devices must be attached to either approach to allow lightning or fault currents to flow safely to ground without damaging the blocking device. 
These types of bypass devices have been successfully applied at lower transformer voltages than EHV, so similar techniques should work for EHV transformers. Product development and testing are required, along with standards development and field testing before deployment could begin, however. That high-speed bypass is normally in the form of a uh, gas discharge tube. The distributed network protocol known as DNP3 is the most popular utility automation protocol in North America. Over 75% of North American utilities were already using or planning to use DNP3 in their SCADA networks. It is applied throughout transmission and distribution networks, providing connections from master stations to substations, between devices within substations, and out to pole top devices along the feeders. DNP3 is an open standard and therefore is a good candidate for the smart grid. Unlike the more advanced IEC 61850 protocol, it does not provide structured naming and complex object models. DNP Secure Authentication is a recently released addition to the popular DNP3 standard. The fact is that there are many transmissions networks that are controlled by DNP devices over insecure networks such as trunked radio systems. These networks should be secured, and common sense dictates that as much of the utility control system that can be protected should be protected from attack as soon as possible. Thanks. IEC 61850 is a standard for the design of electrical substation automation. It resulted from the work of about 60 members from different countries in three working groups starting back in 1995 is part of the IEC TC57 reference architecture for electric power systems. Multiple protocols exist for substation automation, which include many proprietary protocols with custom communication links. Interoperation of devices from different vendors is important to users of substation automation devices, so the abstract data models defined in 61850 can be mapped to a number of protocols. Current mappings in the standard are to MMS, Goose, SMV, and soon to web services. These protocols can run over TCP IP networks and or substation LANs using high-speed switched gigabit Ethernet in order to obtain the necessary response times of less than four milliseconds for protective relaying. But you'd have to be out of your tree to use IP for relaying unless the local relay also was able to open that contact in case you didn't get mm -hmm. your signal. You wouldn't want to fry the transformer. Idaho National Laboratory, March 4, 2007. The Idaho National Laboratory launched an experimental cyber attack on March 2007, which caused a generator to self-destruct, alarming the government and the electrical industry about what might happen if such an attack were carried out on a larger scale, CNN reported. Sources familiar with the experiment said the same attack scenario could be used against huge generators that produce the country's electric power. Some experts fear bigger, coordinated attacks could cause widespread damage to the electric infrastructure that could take months to fix. A dozen newspapers ran this story on a simulated cyber attack on the U.S. power grid infrastructure, which succeeded in destroying the test generator. The Aurora Generator Test was conducted in March of 2007 by the U.S. Department of Homeland Security and involved the remote accessing of a generator control station. It resulted in the partial destruction of a large million-dollar diesel-electric generator. And a lot of bad press. Criminals have been able to hack into computer systems over the Internet and have cut power to several cities, CIA analyst Tom Donahue said in January 2008. Speaking at a conference of security professionals, he disclosed the recently declassified attacks while offering few specifics on what actually went wrong. Criminals launched online attacks that disrupted power equipment in several regions outside of the U.S., he said, without identifying the countries that were affected. The goal of the attacks was extortion, he said, and the CIA made a conscious decision to make this information public. Ira Wakeler, a penetration testing consultant, says he and a team of other experts took a day to set up their attack duels and then launch their attack, which paired social engineering with corrupting browsers on a power company's desktop computers. By the end of a full day of the attack, they had taken over several machines, 
giving the team the ability to hack into the control network overseeing power production and distribution. Winkler says he and his team were hired by the power company, which he would not name, to test the security of its network and the power grid it oversees. He would not say when the test was done, but referred to the time frame as, quote, now, unquote. The company called off the test after the team took over the machines. Spies have penetrated the U.S. electrical grid and left behind malicious software programs that can be used to disrupt the system, according to current and former national security officials. The spies came from China, Russia, and other countries, these officials said, and were believed to be on a mission to navigate the U.S. electrical system and its controls. The intruders haven't sought to damage the power grid or other key infrastructure, but officials warned that they could try during a crisis or war. Referring to electrical systems, a former Department of Homeland Security official said, quote, there are intrusions and they are growing. There were a lot last year, unquote. national security issues. The Associated Press reports the Obama administration has ordered more assertive action aimed at combating persistent cyber espionage efforts from China. The New York Times and Wall Street Journal computer systems were recently infiltrated by hackers inside China. A new national intelligence estimate details a direct Chinese government role in this espionage. Chinese officials deny such efforts. President Obama signed an executive order on February 12th of 2013 saying that America's enemies are, quote, seeking the ability to sabotage our power grid, our financial institutions, and our air traffic control systems, unquote. The order authorizes NIST to finalize a package of standards and procedures that companies should follow to prevent cyber attacks. The Pentagon will also review their procurement rules to encourage compliance with the NIST recommendations. The day after the president spoke, legislation was introduced in the House called CISPA to formalize these arrangements and to uh, legalize the procurement um, discrimination, I guess you'd call it. If you don't have cybersecurity in place, and according to the NIST recommendations, you won't be getting any government contracts. <coughs> The Washington Post and Bloomberg News also reported that they were hacked from China. The New York Times hired the Mandiant Forensics firm to trace the attacks on the newspaper. Their report found the PLA comment crew operating out of this building in Shanghai did not hack them, but rather a nearby subcontractor did the work. Recent attacks from the PLA have included American electric infrastructure, gas lines, and waterworks. One targeted company had remote access to 60% of America's oil and gas pipelines. There have been 140 PLA comment crew intrusions from this building since 2006, according to Mandiant. Cyber threats come from natural disasters, such as hurricanes, tornadoes, earthquakes, tsunamis, ice storms, blizzards, or geomagnetic storms from malicious attacks by individual hackers, from coordinated attacks by nation states, espionage rings, or other non-governmental organizations, such as asymmetric attacks, advanced persistent threats, inside jobs, etc., and from accidental outages due to system errors. In conclusion, it's clear that demand for electric power will increase. According to Time magazine, worldwide electricity consumption will exceed 22,000 billion kilowatt hours by the year 2020. The smart grid needs reliable communications to exist. Substation and distribution equipment testing gaps are being filled with IEEE 1613 and 1613.1. Smart meter testing to ANSI C12.1 still needs more work. There's been slow progress on protecting transmission from hemp and no progress on protecting distribution from hemp. Cybersecurity standards and procedures coming from NIST will help make the network more reliable. And reliability is the ultimate quality indicator for the smart grid, for the equipment, and for the networks running it. I'd like to acknowledge these sources. 
I'm Jerry Ramey of ARC Technical Resources. And I'd also like to thank each of you in the audience for learning about reliability threats to smart grid communications. And thank you for having me. I'll turn the floor over to you, Irfan. Great. Thank you very much, uh, Jerry. And um, at this point, uh, we are open for Q&A. So I'm going to take over the presenter ball. And uh, we'll just keep your contact information uh, on the screen. So if you can do the full, oh, I guess I'll have to do it now. Uh, let's see. All right. So I'm, what I'm going to do is um, send the presenter ball back to you, Jerry, so that you can keep your contact information in a full screen mode. Sure. Yeah. And uh, let's ask the folks um, online uh, to please enter your questions in the chat window, and then we can get started. I'm afraid I won't be able to see those questions. If we have one here. I have a question. This is Chris Hecker. Uh, you, will, you will be able to see uh, the questions. I just uh, want you to uh, open up the chat window by doing the drop-down menu. So as soon as you move back to share desktop. You have to go back, yeah. Share. Oh, I can see it, too. At the top left. I think he's wrong. Top left. <laughs> here it is, over here. I'm Share the desktop. Share desktop. Oh. Yeah, go back to share desktop. And then uh, you will see the control panel shrink to the top, and if you bring it down, you can pick chat, and then it will keep your uh, thing open. So yep. you, you See where it says chat? Yeah. There it is. <clears throat> you can lengthen that like any. For the audio video, video is good for you. Yes, I hope it is. You can lengthen that <clears throat> like any standard window. Yeah. So, um, I think uh, for uh, while you uh, make the adjustments, Jerry, uh, let me just add a few comments here. As you've seen in this presentation, there are many different types of uh, threats to smart grid communication. Uh, some of them are uh, the result of physical phenomena. Some of them are a result of man-made phenomena. And in the phenomena, uh, there are cyber-type attacks, and then there are physical-type attacks. So the uh, things that we saw about the sun and, you know, the geomagnetic storms and its effects, uh, they can be very, very serious. So we may have the best uh, encryption uh, technology, the best authentication, and here we're trying to protect our intelligence systems from cyber attacks. But if we're not aware of all these physical threats that can uh, compromised systems, then all the cybersecurity technology becomes ineffective. So we have to have a very holistic view of threat. And this is where we start talking about cyber physical systems. So we have things that can happen in the physical arena that can have impact on the cyber and vice versa. So the opposite was an example of what uh, Jerry showed in the Idaho National Lab where a cyber event led to a physical damage. And conversely, a physical phenomena like a geomagnetic storm can have an impact on the cyber assets. So we can go both ways. And it is very important for utilities as well as vendors and standards bodies to keep that holistic view in mind as they develop requirements, as they develop specifications, and they build product. And I was very pleased to see Jerry showing all the various mitigations to this phenomena because a lot of us don't have the background. I mean, we have the background, let's say, from computer science or communications or engineering, but this concept of bringing, uh, you know, physical phenomena and its impacts and then showing how you can mitigate those risks from those, those physical activities like those geomagnetic storms and others, I thought was very helpful. So thank you for that, uh, Jerry. So uh, let's like ask, the, yeah, let's ask the people online if you have any questions. I see people are very quiet. So they must have, they must have I, really I have a question locally here. Oh, we've got okay. some questions here. 
Okay, let's go ahead and ask questions over there. Please uh, identify yourself uh, for the sake of the recording and then ask your question. I'm Dale Gutierrez from the, the IEEE and um, City College of San Francisco. My question to Jerry is if you're a, a hippie living off the grid with, um, with solar PV arrays, uh, uh, do they act as, can they act as receiving uh, antennas for an EMP? Well, I, if, if it's going to be a hemp pulse, uh, your solar array won't mean much. We'll all be living in, in something that resembles uh, the dark ages, pardon the pun. If the uh, distribution transformers are fried from a, a weapon from North Korea, let's say, worst case, we can look forward to five plus years of living in the dark. And we can probably look forward to North Korea being flat and shaped like glass. No. A big hole on planet Earth. Yeah. With glass. I would believe that uh, a, a nuclear uh, uh, electromagnetic weapon like that would be the first opening salvo of World War IV. And I think that any country that did that to this nation wouldn't live to see the sunrise. Yeah. Other questions uh, from Foster City? Any other questions? Yes, I have one. Here's one. Um, We've, we've seen a, a lot of uh, display here about various standards bodies and how they've begun addressing this. But the one that kind of jumped out at me by its absence was NERC. <laughs> Where, what has NERC taken a role in this? Should NERC take a role in this? In the electromagnetics uh, and electromagnetic compatibility and the standards that are related to its testing or verification, NERC has no role. Okay. NERC has never been active in EMC. People out in this room know what NERC means, but in the EMC Society or in the SDOs that are doing this, IEEE 1613.1 right. or C12.1, we don't know what those initials mean. Oh, okay. It's cyber only. It's cyber only. Okay. We're, in, we're hardware guys. Yes, sir. Uh, I, I, I personally came from a computer industry. As I understood back in the computer industry days, the computer communication and storage industry or I mean, uh, all these things converge to one thing called the NERPS 3 test to make sure that uh, the box will be ruggedized and uh, it won't be a, a speaker or radio. Uh, it will not be susceptible to the incoming threat. Of course, you have to pay through your teeth for... Was this a NERC specification you were working with? No, no, NERC. Uh, 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 <laughs> NERBS, N E R B. NEBS. Yeah, NEBS. I'm sorry, NEBS. You're referring to a telecommunications standard called a Network, e -Bu Network Equipment Building Specification, right. or NEBS. NEBS, NEBS 3. <coughs> NEBS is a very, GR 1089, is a very well written and severe test for right. telecommunications networks. Yeah. And it's widely used right. so, to certify equipment for central office use. Right. Like Both that. save it from a pulse. But my question, oh, well, I mean, my question here is... I think we'll save it from a pulse. Oh, well, it's an EMP, <laughs> as I understand that. Right. Right? So my question here is uh, why all of a sudden that uh, the power industry starts to really want to uh, do something about it. And, uh, I mean, yes, I understand that, I mean, all these problems do uh, did exist even before smart grid. Oh, sure. Well, the power industry is now admitting that it's addicted to communication. And like the telephone industry, which has already been in the addiction to communications business, right. they're going to have to harden their comm if they want it to keep running. We had a tagline in the EMC Society of the IEEE. We said the smart grid can't interoperate if it can't stay operating. Mm -hmm. and, and that's really what EMC is about. It's about applied reliability. What I the NEBS was for the telecom network, so are these banks of standards 1613 and 13.1 in distribution and substations, C12.1 for the meter on your house. And the next area of study for the uh, NIST SGIP, which is now SGIP 2.0, starting this month, will be uh, in generation to try to solve those problems that I showed you about the nuke plant that goes off when the photographer takes a picture. There have been some truncated, stunted efforts at trying to improve the reliability of old nukes. The problem with old nukes is there's no money to pay people to come to these meetings and develop retrofits for old nuke controls. So General Electric now is moving towards what they call the wireless nuclear 
installation, which makes those of us in the EMC business very nervous. <laughs> Our view is sort of old-fashioned. That's yours. Is. Yes. If it doesn't move, you wire it. If it does move or you can't wire it, you might consider wireless. But it's so much more convenient to just give up on the wires and just go wireless. Is it less reliable inherently? Probably. No, I'm not Probably not as good reliably. But that's the trend. Yes, Dale. Yeah, Dale Gutierrez again. Um, it seems <laughs> it's kind of surprising to me how vulnerable our critical infrastructure seems in view of the fact that the Department of Defense has probably been working on weaponizing EMP for decades. Decades. At least 10 years that we know about. Some of the slides I've showed you are almost, what, seven, eight years old. And things that we were talking about then are now just becoming a reality, like the uh, beam weapon for dissipating crowds <laughs> by heating your skin. We are talking about that in 2008. We've shipped and built that now. It's not being deployed because of uh, geopolitical considerations. Bad press. Which race are we going to fry? Whose people are we going to cook? Is this uh, the ugly American written large? So it, had, it has uh, public relations problems, which is why that weapon is not deployed. But I thought the Hitler scientists already made the first prototype in late 1943. They made the first stealth intercontinental ballistic missile. No, it was a V2 made out of wood. No, but, uh, on, <laughs> on purpose. On wood. Out of wood. On purpose. In addition to that, I thought uh, there was another EMP weapon. I, I was not aware of one. Okay, <coughs> yes, okay so let's uh, continue asking uh, some additional questions. Are there other questions in Foster City? Yes. Yes, we have one. Uh, so you discussed about how hackers use the vulnerability in browser and everything. Why do we need computers in data centers that are even connected to the internet? Why are we so casual about it? Because nowadays, even in a small utility, you have all of these remote operations, even on, at residential homes, right? You can remotely connect, disconnect, let alone solve a station. Why are we mixing uh, why do open I, networks why and closed networks? Why do I need a laptop from home that I use it for internet and probably I connect and do a remote operation. Because the utility wouldn't have to run two networks that way. It's, it's lower cost and more convenient for a utility to use an integrated network that has both public but and private data. Uh, why do we need it's to bite us. people should go to the building and work? I mean, how are we doing things 30 years ago? Most, most uh, control centers that I'm aware of are islanded. Mm -hmm. With laptops floating no. around? No. no. Control centers. Okay. Utility, SCADA, energy management systems. Isolated from the internet. Are isolated from the internet. And from Complete. the network. Of Complete. Complete. And, and usually the network. From ops. But when we talk about the smart grids, many of like, let's say residential meters and everything, and that's a threat too. They can create a blackout by this. Let's just think of pg and &E today, right? They can dis disconnect you. So is that the control center? No, that's no, probably a it separate. Is not. And yes. it's 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 usually a, a diminutive related control center, but I don't see it as uh, the large centers control mostly transmission. Utilities can handle uh, some destruction of their distribution systems and put them back. Hurricanes, you know, as we've seen, but uh, they can't handle the destruction of the transmission system. So those control systems are on. Yes, sir. Uh, did anyone mention anything like uh, who's going to foot the bill? Cause <laughs> <laughs> I mean, all these things, if we have to ruggedize everything. Oh, that's, an, that's an easy answer. The consumer will ultimately foot the bill. Oh. Somehow. All wool comes from the sheep. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I think um, along those lines, uh, it's important to keep in mind that collaborative efforts help drive the cost down because it does not require everyone to keep reinventing the wheel. So if there are use cases and there are threats that have been identified, uh, we can use the concept of economies of scale uh, to build uh, devices that are ruggedized. And as the technology 
for those uh, mitigations is getting cheaper, it's not going to be as big a problem as it used to be in that proprietary realm. Now, having said that, uh, we also have to keep in mind that as more and more of the economy starts depending on these intelligent systems, then the value proposition is based on a simple risk assessment analysis that if you have so much revenue at risk, what are you willing to invest in order to protect that revenue? And that argument needs to be made collaboratively between the utility, the vendors, the integrators, and the public utility commissions, at least for IOUs. In the case of munis, it would be cities. In the case of co-ops, it would be their boards, so that they can free up the appropriate money to protect these assets. But I think that if we just take it a la carte and just show high-value uh, repairs, uh, without providing the proper economic argument, I don't think it's going to go very far. Irfan, I don't know if you've seen smartgridnews.com today, but uh, Central Hudson Gas and Electric was hacked yesterday. Oh, really? And the, uh, the backlash is beginning in, uh, to the uh, magazine. It says, cyber and security is an oxymoron. You can't have cyber and still have security. They're 180 degrees. Cyber is a mighty Mac, security is the peewee. This is the beginnings of the same kind of backlash we saw with the smart grids are cooking my babies. And the, the feeling I'm hearing out on the GP, the general public, is there's no such thing as cybersecurity. If Apple was hacked the day after I made the slide about the PLA Army unit in Shanghai, and two days later Microsoft was hacked, the general public is starting to feel there's no hope. And the GP is starting to feel that this may be a bad idea. Right. So I think and the industry yeah. has a problem here with backlash about the lack of cybersecurity with these successful attacks coming from overseas. I, I understand. And uh, this is something that the Department of Energy and Enrica and APPA and EEI are all uh, thinking. They've got their heads together trying to figure out how do we provide consistent cybersecurity controls across the entire grid? Because there are such different business models when we're dealing with investor-owned utilities and munis and co-ops, and especially for munis and co-ops where their budgets are small and they may not have that many skilled people on their payroll, that maybe there is a possibility for investor-owned utilities to provide some services and bring in third parties to help them uh, reach out to these munis and co-ops and give them those security controls so that a hacker, no matter which part of the electric grid they go to, uh, will see the same type of control. So there, there may be a reason why Central Hudson was hit and not, uh, you know, LIPA or not, um, you know, BGE or any other, like, major utility because they, they're looking for places where they think that the appropriate controls may not be there, not because of any fault of the utility, but it's simple economic. So we have to really start thinking very carefully about who we pay attention to, who we ignore uh, when it comes to the electric grid, because uh, being all interconnected, uh, you could have the weakest link become the launch pad for attacks on more sophisticated systems. The central hut Hudson a Muni or Co-op? It's a IOU and it's owned by Con Ed. Oh, why so? Oh. Is it very small? Or very it is, but it it serves. I think it serves the headquarters of IBM. Oh, Poughkeepsie. Mm -hmm. Well, it's in Poughkeepsie, so it's at least that's where their main manufacturing facility is. But well, they could have asked help from IBM. IBM has. I was. Uh, I have a story, an anecdotal story that. Just to give you something to laugh about, I was acting as a distinguished lecturer for the EMC Society a couple of years ago in 2011. I visited IBM and Research Triangle Park and gave them a presentation about smart grid and some of the problems with cybersecurity that were uh, starting to show up back in 2011. The head of network security of IBM and Research Triangle Park asked me, quote, we have the best minds in the world here, and we have a lot of trouble keeping our networks running. What makes you think you can keep this running? And I didn't know what to say, so I simply said, next question. 
Any yeah. comments, Arfan? Yeah, so uh, what we're Hello. talking about, it's, it's an interesting exercise of some theoretical mathematics here. Because what we are counting on is many points of light in the smart grid. So even if a few don't work, others will and make up for the difference. My only problem with that argument is that as the reserve spin gets smaller and smaller, we'll not have that luxury of redundancy. So everything or very close to everything will have to keep working all the time in order to have a just-in-time network that will provide electricity with five nines of availability. Previously, we were able to overcome our technology barrier by having excess capacity uh, during the off-peak hours, you know, like through coal and hydro and nuclear. But that is going to fast become a luxury as the demand for electricity grows without having centralized power plants being built. And so when you rely on solar and wind and all these other ways, you know, with a million points of light, the question is, who's managing them? Who's securing them? And who, who's accountable if something goes wrong? And it's Previously, completely dependent could, on uh, communications. It's completely yeah. com dependent on it. Exactly. Com communications, that is so affected by physical phenomena, by uh, all types of threats, internal and external, and by these touch points. You know, there was a point earlier about the enterprise IT and the SCADA getting connected. They are very well getting connected. Because when a meter data management system sends an alert to an outage management system in the back end, you're creating those touch points. So uh, the, the key thing uh, to understand here is that we should not look to the many body problem or the many body situation as some kind of panacea for these problems by saying, oh, something will cover it. We have to really think carefully develop these use cases, work them through, in other words, work through these failure scenarios and convince ourselves that the appropriate redundancy and resiliency is there uh, so that you can have that n minus 1, n minus 2, n minus 3, all the way down to some n minus x and still be working at least for the critical function so that lives are not lost like Jerry was talking about in some of the cases in the presentation. Other questions from Foster City or we questions from here. online. I did not get a single question from online, and there are plenty of people online. So please write a question. We still have seven minutes to the end of our webinar, and I would like to hear. I saw some people from Texas, some people from California, uh, different locations. So feel free to uh, jot a question down in the chat window. I know it's kind of late. So you're probably half asleep in, on the East Coast, like it's 10.30 over here in Virginia. But uh, please enter some questions. Uh, I'll take some more questions from Foster City if there are any. We have one here. Yes, sir. I was wondering if, because uh, uh, the EMC and all these kind of uh, issues have been here uh, way before power industry starts to experience. So uh, would the power industry want to take the lead on this particular field or let the old EMC field experts to take the lead. Well, I can uh, uh, speak from experience there. In the EMI Issues Working Group at NIST SGIP last year, we did a survey of a couple of dozen utilities, and we asked them some questions similar to what you just asked. Is how do you decide who makes a good thing and who makes a bad thing? How do you know one's better than the other? Do you read their test procedures? Do you read their test reports? Do you audit their quality assurance systems? The answer was uniformly no. If we buy it and it doesn't work and it gives us problems, we just don't buy it anymore. Oh. So they have this sort of a zero-one view of acquisition. If we buy it and it works, I bought this guy's thing and it works, I'll buy more of his thing. Right. If we bought his thing and it doesn't work, he's out of business, as in forever. So they don't take an interest in this. They expect the, their vendors to take an interest in this. Very that's good. And now, I'm not sure that's what you wanted to hear. Disconcerting. <laughs> <laughs> True. I can show you the response. There we go. We, we have a question here from Vasily yes, Wiley who says, 
do the standards mention, for example, 61850-3, 1613, and 61000 deal with stray EMC from small devices like the camera or on larger scale events like a hemp event? The, the, the camera produces what's called a radiated radio frequency field, and that is covered under um, under 1613 by an American standard, IEEE C37.90.2. So that particular case is covered. The uh, instance of harmful interference you saw at Indian Point was to old equipment that was installed long before that standard was written and it was not tested to it or any other standard. In those days, customers bought, companies bought control equipment, the same stuff that you would buy for a toothpaste factory is the same stuff you'd put in your nuclear control room. It was industrial process measurement and controls equipment, we call it IPM&C. IPM&C equipment was as hardened to 61326 in the IEC which is two levels below what it should have been for a inside the substation fence installation. So they were buying inadequately hardened equipment because that's all that was available. Is there a plan to retrofit? There was a, 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 a an EPRI project was opened for about a year under Accredited Standards Committee C63 to retrofit EMC methodologies into old existing nuclear plants. EPRI dropped out of that effort and laid off the person involved. And now that effort is going to fall apart and die at the next C63 meeting in May. All right. Oh, no, there's no there's no money to fix old nukes to answer your question. And but we're still using old nukes. You're still using old nukes and they're getting more soft by the day as the outside threats continue to get louder and the old nuke is still as sensitive as it used to be. You blow on them and they break. Yeah. If a camera, the difference between a camera on and off breaks a nuclear plant, that plant is unsafe even when it's running. Oh, and that's also uh cost effective to destroy it too. Just camera. Do you know what the utility did about the camera? I have no clue. They forbid cameras in the control room. Oh. <laughs> they did not do anything to address the controls. All right, very good. So in the final concluding uh, minutes, uh, first I would like to thank uh, Jerry Ramey for a very entertaining and informative presentation. I think the combination of the now, three recorded audio uh, uh, will make even Beyonce blush. And um, uh, I think the, the combination of that with your uh, notes uh, in real time, I think, was really a very effective way of presenting, and we thank you for that. Um, also, I would like to say thank you to Chris and Angie for hosting this event in my absence in Foster City. So thank you for all the logistics, and I understand you've provided pizza also over there. So, and I thank all the guests who made the effort to commute during business hours to come to Foster City. It's not the easiest to ride on 101 at that time of the day. So thank you all for coming. How many of you are there? I, I don't know the head count there. Oh, there, 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 were, there were 10, 11 at one point. There was 11 at peak. Okay, 11 at peak. So I I had mentioned 6 to 8, so I hope that uh, you all enjoyed the pizza and the beautiful view uh, from that building. Uh, and then I thank all of you attendees uh, online who have sat in different time zones and, and have paid attention to this presentation after working a full day. So I really appreciate it. Now, uh, the next uh, presentation is going to be on March the 12th. And Nadia Bartol from the Utilities Telecom Council is going to be presenting on supply chain security. And I think that uh, as we are going through uh, the deployments of smart grid, this becomes a real issue where and you look at the entire supply chain and figure out where there might be some weaknesses because there may be third parties involved uh, whose uh, origins we might not know or whose intentions we might not know. 
So I think that uh, that is going to be a very informative presentation, and I hope that you will register for that. That would be March 12th at 1 p.m. Uh, Pacific. Now, in conclusion, what I'd like to say is that the lesson learned from Jerry's presentation, if you are a utility or if you're a product vendor or an integrator, is that just focusing on cyber security and creating a set of controls is not going to secure your grid. You got to have physical security in the form of fences and video surveillance and all types of different sensors on the devices themselves to avoid physical type attacks. And then you have to look at these electromagnetic type attacks that can occur from natural phenomena or intentional uh, things that human beings can do. So you have to have a very holistic approach to securing your infrastructure. Now, when we talk about standards and we talk about regulation, we have to be very careful not to hide behind the, uh, the canopy of standards and say we are compliant just because we have X or Y or Z standards. We still have to go through the use cases, look at the requirements that are coming out, and make sure that the appropriate standards are in place that meet those requirements. And even then, we're not done. We still have to do the bottoms-up approach of doing components testing, systems testing, and then end-to-end -end testing. And as they say, test, 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 because you never know when you may have that anomaly uh, from your test that will completely unravel your strategy. So you're never done. So for those of you who are working in this field, this is ultimate in job security. And I, <laughs> I highly recommend that you keep articulating why you're doing what you're doing so that the business folks in your respective organizations keep releasing the funds for you to do your good work. This is not something where you just plan an IT budget for the next 12 months and try to live within it. Circumstances change. I'm sure people at Central Hudson are probably revamping their cybersecurity strategy as we talk just because of this incident. And all kinds of monies are going to be freed up. But it's much better to do it proactively than reactively. So that is my message for you today. And once again, thank you all. At this point, I'm going to end the recording and bring this uh, webinar to a close. The seminar folks in Foster City uh, can stay there as long as Chris and Andy will let them. So thank you very much. Bye-bye now. Thank you. Have a good night. Bye. You too. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.